Uh, next, we'll have um, Rosalina James uh, from um, the University of Washington. Thank you. Well, that is a tough act to follow, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I, I am finding I really like kind of crossing over to this side of the border and, and having these conversations with folks here. You very open-minded and uh, deep thinking um, and bringing scientists into this fold is really an important task and we need to do a lot more of that here as well as especially where um, where I'm from uh, Washington and United States and I'm going to talk today a bit about where the science is going um, particularly in the United States I'm not as aware as uh, and I'd love to hear more from folks here if this is the same direction you're seeing here in Canada um, but first I wanted to um, to give respects to the first people of this land, um, and thank you so much for your prayer and your songs. And to step back to Mr. Min Minthorn's comment, because uh, I think it sets up for where I'm going with my talk. He said, science moves fast. We should be careful. <laughs> um, I'm not really talking about ancient remains in this discussion. I don't work with archaeologists. I work with geneticists. I work with social scientists. I work with, uh, with community-based organizations and people that participate in genetics research sometimes, uh, indigenous people. Um, and I, I do a lot of work at that crossroads, bringing people together to talk and learn from each other. Um, so I'm looking at what are we going to be doing with DNA or doing with it now that with, with people's DNA and samples that uh, have recently deceased um, are still currently living or may, we may not have collected their DNA or samples yet um, and this is where we're going and where Will they know that we've collected their DNA and what we're doing with it? Dominant narratives. So I, I think um, Dr. Talbert does a great job with this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there, these are dominant narratives, a scientific narrative. It tends to privilege race based and biological explanations of things that happen in the world over emotional, over spiritual. Um, and describe things in kind of compartmentalized ways. And uh, all of this doesn't take into account a lot of the indigenous knowledge and cultural knowledge that we need to start listening to and incorporating into our interpretations. So uh, my husband went to see our family physician a while back and as they always do, he asked, uh, is there anything bothering you that you want to talk about? And my husband said, well, I'd like to lose some weight. And the doctor, who's a wonderful family physician, said, well, we have this new medication that just came out that it's been FDA approved and it doesn't have side effects that we know of. It seems to be a really promising um, thing for losing weight for a lot of people. And my husband said, well, I was thinking of just eating better and exercising. <laughs> and I think that this story leads into what, what I'm going to talk a bit about to introduce to you today, where that, that really kind of has launched us into a world where genetics is leading, um, what, why, the answers we're seek, seeking for all of our problems. Um, and medicalization is kind of the, the term that's been coined. It's the process by which common problems, emotions, traits come to be described as medical problems. So. A lot of children are picky eaters. We now have a way of describing that as selective eating disorder. Um, people are heavy. We now have ways to, metrics to show whether you're overweight uh, around a normal air, uh, weight for your height or obese. 
And depression, um, there's a whole spectrum of ways to describe that. One of them is, is bipolar disorder. And senility, we used to say grandma just was forgetting things, or actually I am already. But, uh, but you're, you're starting to you know, remember things differently. Um, and now we are starting to learn a lot about amyloid plaques in the brain and um, how we start to lose our memory, um, as well as many other things that, that constitute different types of dementia on that scale. So we're starting to define these things through science. Insomnia is, uh, there's a lot of things out there around sleep disorder now, and really fascinating work. Um, things we never really even dreamed of, um, we're figuring out. So, but what we're seeing in context of defining these conditions more in the human condition, I'm really focusing on at this point, is we, Oftentimes, this leads to an increase of treatment of some sort. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is, is one example. Uh, one study showed by the CDC showed that 2 million more kids were diagnosed with ADHD over an eight-year period in 2011-2012. In 11% 11 of US kids 4 to 17 years old uh, were diagnosed. And of the kids that had ADHD, um, ADHD almost 70% take some kind of medication and they continue to take medication throughout their lives. Sociologists have been aware of this phenomena for a long time. Um, it describes it as an extension of medical authority in different areas of everyday life, which is thus understood from the perspective of social control. And it implies when behavior deemed to be deviant is transferred from the social to the medical arena. As medical knowledge bases have grown, discoveries have revolutionized biotech and pharmaceutical industries. So what we've seen over the years, over the decades, is really a, an interweaving with uh, industry and our, our medical enterprise. Um, promotion of drugs, products to providers and public evolved into new markets for things like social anxiety and other commonplace experiences that uh, subsequently were targeted for medical in intervention. These are a few ads, maybe some of you have seen them, for uh, direct-to-consumer ads for, for uh, drugs that help you go to sleep. So butterfly kind of floating around over your head. Usually you don't know what it is about until the end, and then you figure, oh, it's for people who have trouble sleeping. So it's really tied into our media workforce. Um, and. Uh, the focus has really direct, been directed on identifying risk factors to be treated by pharmaceutical and personalized medicine. And now uh, we're looking at a new phase. We're calling it uh, precision medicine. Um, and we have a new initiative for, I think they're trying to bring in like two, over $200 million for, to uh, sequence the full genomes of a million Americans. Now we see the onset of the genomic era uh, in the early 21st century, and academic ex interest expanded beyond uh, just looking at population migration, but looking at more medically driven population genetic research. And the promise of drugs, genomics, neuroscience, genetic diagnostic tools, many of which are also intertwined with the marketplace, um, has introduced expanded areas for exploration and sustained a medicalization into a new era. A lot of people call it genomatization, so we're even creating new words around it. In the U.S., this mo model is very dominant and permeated modern society and culture where, whereby common problems, emotions, behaviors are described as medical issues, again, framed as problems uh, instead of what we should be experiencing. And dealing with, um, without medication. So, uh, but these are framed as problems that we can treat at some point. And the frameworks for individual and group identity are increasingly described through a lens of genetic derived logic over the cultural, political, historical, and societal conditions that shape social beings. I think that's a really key pivotal point. We're not talking about groups anymore or communities. We're talking about our own personal genetic profiles and genomic profiles of populations. And it's a 
real shift in the language that we're seeing in the public discourses. And it's a very complex relationship that these technologies have had with identity politics. Catherine Bliss is some, somebody who's written quite a lot about this. Marketization of race through genetic testing, drugs, et cetera, thus redirects identity from an inclusive political group empowerment to a personal negotiation base for social status. And it's a reductionist understanding of inferences between genetics, our biological selves, and our identity, which, as we've been talking about today, is a lot bigger than just our biological selves. The dominant voices behind consumer genetics ignore this complexity and stick to a simple narrative in which our genes have the power to tell us who we are. So medicalization and geneticization is a pill for every ill and a genetic solution for every problem. But the big question is, does our genome really tell us that much about ourselves? And who's asking that? How many voices are asking that now? That's the hard part is I don't see enough people pushing back on that in the, the, um, the dialogue that's going on, at least in the United States. Um, here's an example. Could a genetic test pr predict the risk for suicide? There's actually a, a, an organization at Mount, Mount Sinai Hospital that's working on a genetic test to predict suicide. Given how many people take antidepressants, it's already linked to how many uh, downstream products they might sell. Um, but why not why not use the decades of behavioral science research we've done, the decades of indigenous knowledge we have around how to empower young people, young men, we know that there's a high risk, how to empower them to be part of a community, to have the, an important role, to learn reef netting again, um, to use their physical strength. Um, and, and reincorporate that into how we're, how we're creating community and supporting our people. Why are we going to the shiny things instead of putting our resources into um, these not so sexy solutions? San Diego, it's also gone into consumer genetics. We are fascinated with genomes and our genetic profiles. So you talked a little bit about 23andMe. This is a, a, a site that uses, they basically use genomic and personality profiles to set up matches. Genes are not static. Epigenetics, is, it looks at how DNA evolves. Gene, DNA, DNA is just, uh, it, it has expression at different times. You eat something. It, a gene expresses differently. <laughs> if it's cold out, if you've had enough sleep or not, your, your genes express differently. And we need to take into account those complexities of genomics and environmental factors. So we're starting to do that with epigenetics. It's still a new science, though. It's very complex. And I don't know if we can get there on a biological level um, to really understand the way we, we, we are and how we should be. Um, so here's an example. They're looking at stress. They're looking at trauma. This is, a, of course, you know the story of residential schools and boarding schools. Um, we have all been affected by that. This, uh, this is not just generations ago. This affects my family right now. Um, in fact, that, that, is, that was my great, great aunt in that quote. Moving forward, we are also looking at other environmental factors and interactions with our genomic makeup. It just gets more and more complex, but um, are we answering the question in a way that we're going to make a difference is, is what I want to get at. So other environmental factors, what we eat, contaminants, I mean, these are really important questions we want, it, we want to talk about, and how does that interact with our gene genomic profile and cause problems? health conditions, um, vulnerabilities. Um, but not, we also want to know what to do about it, not just to ask those questions and define them, but how are we going to do something about it in the end, um, including cleaning up our water systems and our, and our earth and our relatives, right, that are non-human. Um, and recognizing we're, we're urban, we're reservation, we're not one kind of people, we're everywhere. Um, this thing's running away from me, so I'm going to move fast. <laughs> identity. So what does this have to do with identity? Everything. When I think about my great-grandfather, I'm an enrolled Lummi, and my great-grandfather was Duwamish. 
he they they didn't allow native people to be in the in the Seattle area after a certain hour for a period of time. Um, and he got in a canoe, moved up to Lummi, and that's how we ended up in rural Lummi. So tell me how that tells you, uh, how, how can that be teased apart through my biology? I don't really know. Um, but it's who you are. It's your cultural identity, your multicultural identity. We can't take the human piece out of this. Um, how you're self-identified, your experiences, whether you're enrolled, whether you're a descendant. Um, enrolled or you're part of multiple indigenous communities. Many, many people are. The indigenous people forever have understood that you need to be sure you don't marry your cousin. You need to ask questions. <laughs> they, they've always been geneticists and scientists. It's a misplaced concreteness we're putting on, we're putting too much weight on what science can do and we need to think outside that box and accept other knowledges as part of the solutions that we're seeking. Propelled by the promise of using genetic variation information to address health disparities, indigenous people once again need to weigh the benefits and potential risks of being exploited by, by science. Um, and I, I, I think we need, we need to do this in a way that's very thoughtful and not just shut the doors to it because science has a lot to offer. But in order to do that, we need to become educated and become part of that conversation. Um, NIH, our National Institutes of Health, is going in a different direction than what I think communities are really interested in. One that's more around broad consent and um, for, for samples for DNA that you can, can be used for in the future for studies that they wouldn't have to go back and ask for permission to use it for something else uh, like schizophrenia or whatever other research questions come up, um, and broad access to data. So big repositories, big data, big samples um, from many, many populations. Tribes have ownership, control over interests over data, but I should say that there are a lot of people who are not part of federally recognized tribes that have these same interests, and, and we need to consider how to protect them and support them in being part of biomedical research and other kinds of research, but not being harmed by it and exploited by it in the end. So essentially, we need, I think Dr. Tall Bear did a great job of talking about the historical missteps that we've had, um, some of them. But we need to really be thinking about why are we asking a certain question? Um, and how is it going to benefit, maybe not just our community, maybe not us, maybe not our relatives, or even our children, but many generations down the road. Um, there's a lot of indigenous groups that are interested in participating in research or being a partner in research or even leading their own research. Um, and scientists can be a play an important role in that, but we have to actually educate ourselves. As scientists, I, I kind of wear all these hats, so. <laughs> Indigenous people and scientists, um, I think it's an important point to make that we do need more indigenous scientists, indigenous politicians, indig indigenous health administrators and everything all across the board. Um, but these are just a couple of examples I'm not going to go into of things that have recently occurred that I love that, uh, the Nichilnath, I'm sorry if I misspoke that. Um, have in their ethics code that came out of this, uh, this um, event where their samples were used or misused. Um, that researchers are collectors of information and producers of meaning which can be used for or against indigenous interests. We need to be thinking about data because it is a resource. Um, I, it's, it's maybe the new age of, of those of, of the archaeological remains you're finding. Um, this is going to be around forever. And it can, lots of new questions can be asked about it. How are we going to protect it and put the right um, restrictions on it, control on it, so that it's used appropriately? And I am about done. So I have one minute. OK. Again, tribal sovereignty is really important to be considering. Um, 
not many scientists understand it. In fact, not many people understand it or even know it exists. And in fact, sometimes a lot of people don't know Native Americans still exist. I think we're all in museums. Um, so we always have to be educators. Wherever we're going, we have to wear that hat. Um, and anytime negotiating with scientists, you're, you're going to have to, I mean, it should be they have to go through a curriculum themselves to consider doing this kind of work with tribes. Um, I'm going to end there. I don't think we have a, a we have a lot of models, but we, uh, um, I think actually Canada's model with OCAP and some of your other ethics codes um, out of CIHR, uh, um, you're, 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 you're further ahead than we are. And uh, we look to you for ways that we can implement uh, this kind of ethics code in our country. But I know there's still glitches on the ground. And so thank you so much for your time. <laughs>